Hey, faithful listener. Welcome to season six of the Bible Explained podcast, the podcast where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and enjoy today's discussion from the book of John. Good morning, faithful listeners. You've tuned in to the Bible Explained podcast with your host, Jen. That is me. And today we're going to be discussing John chapter 19, verses 31 through 37. And if you didn't catch Tuesday's episode, I do recommend going back and listening to that because we talked about Jesus's death on the cross. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about Jesus still being on the cross after he died and the events that unfolded with that and some of the prophecies that Jesus has fulfilled from the Old Testament. We're going to talk about all that today. So stay tuned. We're going to be reading John chapter 19, once again, verses 31 through 37. So grab your Bible, your cup of coffee, or your cup of tea, or whatever else you're choosing to drink this morning, and let's read this. I'll be reading out of the W.E.B. Therefore the Jews, because it was the preparation day, so that the bodies wouldn't remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a special one, asked of Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Therefore the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They didn't break his legs. However, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. He who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth that you may believe. For these things happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. A bone of him will not be broken. Again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they pierced. We already talked about how Jesus was on the cross and how he possibly was quoting all the Psalms from Psalm 22 all the way to Psalm 31 verse 5 while he was up there on the cross. Because a lot of what Jesus said, a lot of his last words, mimicked a lot of what was going on in those Psalms. So that was an interesting thing that we discussed on Tuesday. But one of Jesus's last words was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, which was Psalm 31 verse 5. And also, it is finished, or it has been paid in full. And so Jesus, by himself, died. Nobody killed him. Nobody could kill Jesus. He died all on his own. He chose to give up his spirit. And every single gospel says that same thing. They say, and Jesus gave up his spirit. Nobody could take Jesus's life from him. In fact, Jesus himself said that nobody takes my life from me. I give it of my own free will. So Jesus gave his life for his own free will after saying everything was finished or that he had paid everything. He had paid it all. So it says, then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit in verse 30. So where we started today was verse 31, where it says, therefore the Jews, because it was the preparation day. So the that actually has been a topic of debate for some people because a lot of people think that John is talking about the preparation day of the Passover, which would be basically the day before Passover, because Passover began at night. All Jewish holidays began when the sun went down the night before, if that makes sense. And then uh, they would end when the sun came up a lot of times. Now, of course, Passover was a week long holiday. So there was multiple days in the Passover day. But the preparation day technically for Passover would have been the day before or rather the night before Passover started. So a lot of people are like, you know, John doesn't have the story right or the other Gospels don't have the story right because Jesus died on Passover like it had already happened. You know, Jesus had his last supper, the last Passover supper with his disciples. So a lot of people ask, well, did Jesus have Passover the night before Passover? And he died on the preparation day of Passover because he's like the lamb that was prepared for Passover, basically. And then other people say, no, Passover was already happening. And this preparation day that John talks about is the preparation day for the Sabbath day, which would be Friday because every Sabbath was on a Saturday and Sabbath was a special day as well. Now, this is what I believe. 
because John actually kind of alludes to that. He says it was the preparation day so that the bodies wouldn't remain on the cross on the Sabbath because that Sabbath was a special one. So because that Sabbath was during the week of Passover, it was a very special Sabbath day. And because Jesus died on the preparation day for the Sabbath, not for the Passover, as Passover was already happening, but for the Sabbath, the Jews didn't want Jesus to remain up on that cross because of the whole religious purification thing that people had to go through for the Sabbath day. Actually, we've, we've kind of talked about that a little bit if you're listening over on the Old Testament episodes where Joshua was actually hanging kings because Joshua was going on like a rampage to totally take the promised land for the Israelites. And Joshua already has killed multiple Canaanite kings where we're talking about in the book of Joshua. And Joshua was hanging them up on trees. But you'll notice that when evening came, Joshua would take the bodies off of the trees and bury them. Now, that was a Jewish law that God had made that Israelites could not hang people up on trees, like say in the case of execution, for more than a day. When nighttime came, those bodies had to be taken off the trees and buried. So in order for the Jews to not break that law, especially since this Sabbath was extra holy, they wanted Jesus and the other two robbers to be taken off the trees, off the, the crosses, in order to not break that law. So they go to Pontius Pilate and ask that the people on the cross might have their legs broken. Okay, now what would this do? This would speed up the process of death for the people on the cross. So John, in a lot of ways, I think has a lot of resentment for the Jewish people. In a lot of the ways he writes, you can tell that he, even here, is kind of irritated, I think, at the religious piousness of the Jews going and talking to Pilate about having the legs broken of the people on the cross so that they would die faster. It was just almost like a lack of care for the people on the cross that the Jews had. And John is kind of showing this religious, you know, piousness, pride that the Jews have here for this with the, the lack of care for the people being excruciatingly killed on that cross. They ask that the legs might be broken so that the bodies can be taken away early before nightfall happens, before the Sabbath day happens, so that they don't break their Jewish laws of having people hanging on trees overnight. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the second who were crucified with Jesus. Now, this would have been horrifying, absolutely horrifying. I think for everybody involved in this process, firstly, for the men up on the cross to have their legs broken in that situation would be terrifying because the legs were what propped up the men to be able to take a breath of fresh air. Because when you have your arms out like that, you slowly suffocate to death. It's very hard to catch a breath. So the legs being broken would cause the, the men up on the cross to not be able to catch a good breath because they wouldn't be able to prop themselves up with their legs anymore to get that breath of air. So they would die so much faster. They would die of suffocation. So the soldiers come and, and break the legs of the two robbers who were side by side to Jesus because Jesus was in the middle of those two robbers. One of the things I actually thought about was, man, like the one robber who was up on the cross who was going to be with Jesus in paradise that day must have just been, I can't even imagine it, like terrified, horrified of his legs being broken, but maybe possibly also in some ways relieved that he wouldn't be in excruciating pain for very much longer. But even so, this kind of shows that the prosperity gospel doesn't exist because the prosperity gospel preaches that if you believe in Jesus, immediately all your problems are going to go away. God's going to grant you a fancy car and money and riches. But yet, right after this this uh, 
man on the cross comes to Jesus, his legs get broken in this horrifically excruciating way. So nothing about scripture preaches the prosperity gospel. Whenever prosperity is mentioned in scripture, it's always talking about the joy that God gives us or the life after death that we get to experience, which is like so much more grand, more wonderful than earthly life could ever, ever be. So anyway, the soldiers come and break the legs of the two men that were side by side to Jesus on the cross. But then they they come to Jesus and they see that he's already dead. So they didn't break his legs. And it actually turns out that Mark, the gospel of Mark, talks about how Pontius Pilate was shocked to hear that Jesus had already died because Jesus had been up on the cross for a handful of hours before he died. And a lot of men could remain up on the cross for around two and a half days before they died sometimes. Like it was supposed to be a very long and drawn out process. So the fact that Jesus died only a few hours up on the cross was something miraculous in and of itself. But Pontius Pilate was shocked to hear that Jesus had died and actually asked one of the centurions to go check for sure if Jesus was in fact dead. And Jesus, yes, was in fact dead. So they didn't break Jesus's legs. I don't know if it was because it was kind of difficult to break legs and there was no point to break Jesus's legs. So they didn't go through the energy of doing that, maybe. I don't know. Or they just didn't see the necessity of it. But one of the soldiers came up to Jesus and pierced him through the side. I would guess to make sure that he was, in fact, for sure dead. They pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. I actually paused the podcast for a moment to find the verse where it says that the soldier who pierced Jesus with the spear said that he was the son of God, said that Jesus was the son of God. And it turns out that that verse does not exist. (laughs) All the media I've ever seen, I guess, growing up over the years shows like when Jesus was pierced through with the spear, the soldier who, you know, saw the blood and water spill out of Jesus's side was like, this man is the son of God. But there's no verse that actually says that unless I'm completely wrong and I'm missing something, I could not find a verse that says that the soldier who pierced Jesus became a Christian. It doesn't say that anywhere, but it does say that right after Jesus died, there was a huge earthquake. And this earthquake actually ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom. And when all that happened, the centurion who was nearby Jesus, after he saw the earthquake and everything that went on, he was the one who said, Surely this was a righteous man. Surely this is the son of God. So the centurion was, in fact, converted to believing in Jesus, but it wasn't with the spear going through Jesus's side. It was with the earthquake and him watching everything that was going on. So I found that kind of funny. And that's why you got to be careful with like media. (laughs) This is my little lecture, I guess. Sometimes media like The Chosen or The Passion of the Christ or these other famous, you know, Jesus movies we watch that depict Jesus can give us the wrong perception of what really happened. Because, of course, artistic liberties have to be made in movies that depict Jesus and disciples and followers and Jesus's death. And yet I truly believe that the person who, you know, put the spear through Jesus, became saved because I always remember seeing that in media growing up. So watch out with media. Always just read scripture because scripture is the truth. Media about Jesus takes scripture. It's based on scripture, but it might not necessarily be scripture. So that's my my lecture for today. (laughs) Okay. So anyway, the soldier pierced Jesus's side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. So now in verse 35, John starts talking about himself. He who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth that you may believe. John is talking about himself right there. He's saying, look, I was there at the cross. I saw 
all these things unfold. And I know that my testimony is true because I'm giving it from what I saw take place. So that's how we know the disciple that Jesus loved was in fact John. He was the only disciple mentioned ever being near Jesus's cross. And he testified about all these things. He saw all these things happen. And because it was John's testimony, he knew that his testimony was the truth. Not to mention, we also have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three other testimonies that testify about Jesus's death in the same way that John testified about it. So these things all happen, John said, so that scriptures might be fulfilled. A bone of him will not be broken. We mentioned Psalm 22 last week where it says in one of the verses that the psalmist can count all of his bones. Now, Psalm 22 was a direct prophecy of everything that was going to happen to Jesus on the cross. So Psalm 22 prophesied that Jesus would be able to count all of his bones. In other words, he didn't have any broken bones, not to mention passages from Numbers 9 verse 2, where it talks about the Passover lamb and how the lamb was supposed to be sacrificed. The bones were not supposed to be broken from the Passover lamb. That is how God wanted Passover to be done. And then on top of that, Psalm 34 mentions that God protects all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. That's a prophecy about Jesus's bones being protected. Just like how the Passover lamb, its bones were not supposed to be broken. Jesus was our Passover lamb and his bones were not supposed to be broken. So none of them were broken. And that is why Jesus's legs were not broken. This is also why I believe Jesus chose to give up his spirit at the time that he did, because it was the perfect time for him to die so that that Roman soldier wouldn't break Jesus's legs so that that prophecy would be fulfilled. But then in verse 37, John mentions another prophecy to conclude here. He says, again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. And that is a prophecy from Zechariah 12, verse 10, which says, I will pour on David's house and on all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they will look to me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and will grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for his firstborn. That's a prophecy about Jesus and everything that was going to happen when Jesus gave his life for people. He was going to give grace to all the people of the world. And all of us look to the one who the Roman soldier pierced. We all look to him for our salvation. So that's what John is talking about here. This prophecy mentioned about Jesus. They will look to me whom they have pierced. So now that we're talking about prophecy, how many prophecies did Jesus fulfill? He fulfilled a lot. He fulfilled 344 prophecies, I think it was, out of the Old Testament. So basically, every single prophecy that there was to fulfill from the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, Jesus fulfilled it. Jesus fulfilled every single messianic prophecy that there was to fulfill. The only prophecies from the Old Testament that haven't been fulfilled yet are basically the ones of the end times, which haven't been fulfilled yet, but will be fulfilled. And Jesus, of course, will fulfill all of those when the time is right for those to be fulfilled. So Jesus fulfilled every single Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. This is basically impossible to do. All 300 plus prophecies of Jesus were fulfilled by him. And so many Jewish people have actually come to a belief in Jesus because of that direct fact. In fact, I know of a person, Andrew Rappaport. I had him on the podcast when we talked about an episode in Leviticus. And he mentioned to me his story about how he was a Jewish boy growing up, didn't believe in Jesus at all. And somebody sat down with him and talked to him about all the prophecies that Jesus actually fulfilled. And Andrew Rappaport, having a very good knowledge of Jewish prophecies, came to see that Jesus had fulfilled them all. 
And now Andrew Rappaport calls himself a Christian, not even a Messianic Jew. And I actually asked him about that. This is off topic a little bit. But I asked him, I said, why don't you call yourself a Messianic Jew? And he was like, because we operate under grace and Messianic Judaism actually goes back to the law. And we don't need to do that because we operate under grace. And I thought that was pretty interesting that he takes that approach that he doesn't even call himself Messianic Jewish. But the point is, is that Jesus fulfilled every single Messianic prophecy of the Old Testament, the same book that the Jewish people have nowadays. Jesus fulfilled all of it. He is the Messiah. He paid the price for us in full on the cross, and he was pierced for us. And we, you and I, when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, we look to him who was pierced for our salvation just as the prophecy said we would. Alrighty, faithful listeners. Well, tomorrow we're going to be discussing Joshua chapter 12. So I hope that you tune in then because we are just flying through the book of Joshua. We're actually going to be done with it, I think, in July, potentially. Maybe the beginning of August at the very latest. So we're going to fly through Joshua and move into the book of Judges very quickly here. But anyway, guys, I will see you all tomorrow bright and early for an episode of Joshua, 6 a.m. or whenever you choose to wake up and listen. Happy listening and God bless.